Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining the Wilson Center's Maternal Health Initiative, along with the U.S. Agency for International Development's Momentum Country and Global Leadership, or MCGL, for a panel discussion titled The Power of Partnerships, Country Perspectives for Sustainable Maternal, Newborn, Child, and Adolescent Health, and Family Planning Programs. This is a really timely topic, and I look forward to engaging with an esteemed panel of global experts to learn more on the country-led initiatives that are improving the health and well-being of women and their families. I'm Sarah Barnes, and I'll be your moderator today. I direct the Maternal Health Initiative, or MHI, at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. I'm joining you today from Bern, Switzerland. For those of you who are unfamiliar, the Wilson Center is a critical source of nonpartisan foreign policy research and analyses where we work to tackle global issues through independent research, open and honest dialogue, like what we have today, and actionable ideas. At the Maternal Health Initiative, we focus on a multitude of global issues, including maternal and child health, gender equity, and sexual and reproductive health and rights, as well as their connections to US foreign policy. Today's event is the third and final in a series between MHI and MCGL meant to elevate country voices in the global dialogue on maternal, newborn, and child health and family planning. Our panel today will tackle the necessity of partnerships, particularly during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the necessity of partnerships and efforts to improve maternal and child health and family planning outcomes. We'll focus much of our attention today on partnerships related to communities and community leadership, partners with youth organizations and public-private partnerships. MCGL, as many of you likely know, works with partners, including but not limited to ministries of health, the private sector, civil society, and faith-based and youth-led organizations, and prioritizes those partnerships to collectively build effective and sustainable improvements in the health of mothers and children. In-country partnerships are vital to progress in global health and family planning programs and today's panelists will share how they have personally experienced strong and inclusive partnerships to the betterment of their programs and their communities. I'd like to take a moment before we start to thank USAID's Momentum Country and Global Leadership for making this event possible. At the Maternal Health Initiative, we've been thrilled to engage in this series with MCGL, particularly given the focus around the deep experience and promising practices of partners in low and middle income countries whose voices have often been underrepresented in global conversations. Before we get started also, a quick thank you to all of our panelists who are logging in today from around the world um, and here to join us and share their expertise. I'm really looking forward to this robust discussion and learning from each of you on what you know of the power of partnerships. I'd also, also like to thank my colleagues at the Wilson Center particularly Dikshita Ramanarayanan, and the support from Angela Pereira from MCGL in bringing this event together. For today's event, we've agreed to go by first names after the in initial introductions, just to keep it a bit more informal and more discussion-like. So to kick things off today, I'm honored to introduce Jacqueline Kalman to give opening remarks. Jackie works at the Uganda Mission and is currently on a fellowship with the Office of Country Support at USAID in Washington. She has a wealth of experience in public health, including a focus on working with local partners and increasing local ownership and local voices, as well as policy and programming. I can't think of a better person to kick things off. Jackie, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, fellow speakers. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you joining us from around the world online. First, may I thank the Wilson Center's Maternal Health Initiative and USAID's Momentum Country and Global Leadership Activity for organizing this very important event. I also want to thank the speakers for taking part in this event and to you all for connecting this morning and I look forward to a very interesting and robust discussion. As Sarah mentioned today, I'm wearing two hats. I work with the USAID mission in Uganda as a deputy team lead for the HIV program. And at the same time, I'm on a detail with the USAID Washington Country Support Office as a fellow focusing on localization. 
So personally, working with the, in partnership with local organizations in Uganda has afforded me great opportunity to hear and learn from my communities on how to better meet their needs and preferences to advance their health outcomes, and also how to change the way we partner in a more flexible, locally led and sustainable manner. The USAID Administrator, Samantha Power, during her new vision speech at, George, at Georgetown University on November 4th last year, stated that if we truly want to make aid inclusive, local voices need to be at the center of everything we do. And this certainly resonates with all of us in the field. Localization is fundamentally about putting local context aspirations, dynamics, organizations, and change agents at the center of our programming. It's about recognizing that development agencies like USAID do not direct or drive change. Rather, we support or help to catalyze local change processes. We all know health challenges are complex and unique to the countries and local communities experiencing those challenges. Whether it's a middle income country striving for universal health care or to resource commodities domestically or to lower income countries struggling with outbreaks um, of disease on top of the systemic health challenges. Our support should be tailored to where those countries are and where they want to go. When we emphasize local ownerships of prioritization of processes, resources and implementation, we're ensuring our collective efforts are responsive to local priorities, accountable to local constituents and communities, and to draw on local capacities, networks, and resources. And the reality is that with local ownership, results are more likely to be sustained. And the only way we can achieve this is through partnerships. Conversely, when local communities, organizations and institutions are not engaged in ways that they support the sense of their ownership and investment in health programs, we know from experience that shiny new hospitals fail to serve the people who need it the most or treatments and vaccines aren't taken because messaging was tailored to how people uh, wasn't tailored to how people traditionally receive advice or perhaps it goes against social norms. We acknowledge that all partners and organizations play a very important role in this process. For instance, at my mission in Uganda, while we've increased the portion of our health funding directly to local partners from 3% in 2020 to about 57% this year, we recognize that all organizations, international and local, have a role to play. The international organizations play a crucial role in capacity strengthening, mentoring, and coaching of local organizations. They are also innovators and their global reach helps to ensure that we are applying lessons from one context to another. We also recognize the private sector. The private sector organizations can be important uh, sources of financing, technology, and innovation. So far, we in Uganda have partnered with private, local private organizations in supply chain procurement, distribution, and management. Also, direct partnerships with the government are, key, are a key component to country-owned and localized USAID health programs. We have direct partnerships with select Ugandan ministries at national and subnational levels, which are important for strengthening health systems for primary health care. And we've seen promising results in terms of ownership, governance, and accountability. So in addition to providing funding and forging partnerships with key actors in the health system, we have intentionally built in systems to integrate local voices in all aspects of our programs, elevating the voices of underrepresented populations, women, girls, youth, and the elderly, and other socially marginalized individuals like the Batwa community in the Southwest Uganda and the Karamajong in the Northeast of the country. Our approach is multi-pronged and it goes beyond a set of specific projects and programs, providing a cross-cutting lens through which USAID Uganda addresses key health challenges including the impact of COVID on, on the health system. 
This holistic cross-cutting approach was recently emphasized by Administrator Power in her keynote address at the so Society for International Development Annual Conference, where she said that we have to focus on driving development progress, not simply development programs. So we look forward to hearing from our colleagues today from Kenya, Zambia, Bangladesh, and Indonesia, and most importantly, from you all. I wish you a very productive uh, discussion today. And thanks once again, Sarah and the team for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. That was a great way to kick us off and a great reminder to me um, to also thank our audience today for taking the time to be here today. We have two different ways that you can submit questions for the panel and we have the end of our event today um, will be dedicated to answering your questions. So please send questions for our panelists. They can be directed towards a panelist or for the group in general. There's two ways to do that. First is the way we've traditionally done this and you can send questions through email to mhi at wilsoncenter.org. Um, that's mhi, stands for maternal health initiative at wilsoncenter.org. Um, please just submit your questions and we will do our best to get to those um, later in our program. The other way is you can also submit questions um, through the event page where you're all watching this event right now. Below the video, there is a chat box. So please also feel free to put your questions into that chat box. And then my colleagues at MHI will get those questions to me and I will then get them to our panel. Um, and I will remind you later on in the event um, to please submit those questions. Um, your questions will help us to guide the conversation to be sure that we're really addressing the aspects of partnerships that you, the audience, want to hear about most. Okay, so now we're moving on to the heart of the event. I am going to introduce our four incredible panelists um, straight through, and you can just raise your hand when I introduce you, and then we'll let them do um, their presentations. So first up is Margaret Wanja. Margaret is the Business Development Director for Youth for Sustainable Development. She is also the YSD, which is Youth for Su Sustainable Development, Project Manager for the Youth-Led Social Accountability in Sexual Reproductive and Family Planning Project in Machakos, Kenya. She is passionate about building the capacity of young people to participate in the development of their own communities. Welcome, Margaret. We look forward to hearing from you in a bit. Second is Dr. Angel Muchi. Bunkashi. Angel is the assistant director in charge of reproductive health at the Ministry of Health Zambia. He is a medical doctor and postgraduate with postgraduate degrees in public health as well as obstetrics and gynecology. He has worked in the current position at the Ministry of Health providing leadership in maternal and child health. Welcome, Angel. Um, next, we have Litan Bala. Litan also goes by Xavier, so we'll be calling him Xavier during this event. He is the program director with World Mission Prayer League Lamb Hospital in Bangladesh. He has 18 years of experience in community development, especially in maternal newborn child health and sexual and reproductive health with NGOs. Welcome, Xavier. And last but not least, we have Dr. Kalsam Komanyarni, who goes by Ibu Yani. Um, Ibu Yani is the Director of Quality and Activation of um, Health Services at the Ministry of Health in Indonesia. She previously served as Head of the Center for Health Financing and Insurance at the Ministry of Health Indonesia since 2016 and finalized the regulation on public-private partnerships for health services during her time. Welcome Ibu Yani. So to kick things off then, we will turn things over to Margaret. Hello everyone, um, thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, my name is Margaret Wanda, uh, the Business Development Director for Youth for Sustainable Development. Just to give a small background of who we are, we are a youth-led organization that strives to promote champion for inclusive approaches to youth empowerment through youth participation and social accountability in Machakos, Kenya. And through the support from Momentum Country Global Leadership, uh, we are implementing a project on youth-led social accountability um, to identify gaps and work with county health staff to improve family planning and productive health services for young people. Mm -hmm. 
So um, let's talk about how to lower barriers um, and unlocking the power of uh, youth organizations. So why should we partner with youth-led organizations? Uh, youth-led organizations bring value um, in social accountability work. For example, what YSD is doing, we are giving youth opportunity to drive change according to what youth, young people want and need. Um, and you're also bringing perspective um, and voice of the youth to conversations and decision making. Uh, youth are often undermined and underestimated in, uh, in most communities, yet they know their issues better than anyone else and they can provide effective solutions to addressing their issues and can work to ensure that beauty bearers are held accountable to delivering um, quality services for the youth. Uh, the youth also have a unique role they play in social accountability. They have the ability to better uh, engage subgroups of adolescents and young and the youth. Uh, for example, why is they work with um, uh, youth with disabilities? We work with the LGBTQ community and youth engaged in transactional sex. Uh, we have strong history and relationships with young people. Uh, we have sustained participation and enrollment from young people. Um, YSD and has led to youth champions on social accountability, allowing YSD to quickly identify youth volunteers for training on accountability. And you also have a trusted reputation within community and distinction of being youth led. Uh, we have good relationships with the youth department, the uh, Ministry of Health, and so forth. So um, that's why we should partner with youth led organizations because of the unique role and the value that they bring uh, on the table. And so what, we, what are the barriers that we're facing and the challenges that youth-led youth organizations experience in partnerships? Uh, one of them um, is operating barriers within projects. You'll find that uh, there is a lot, a lot of misperceptions in terms of um, in the ground. You find there will be comparison with other um, non-governmental organizations that are not youth-led. Uh, and this uh, raises the expectations that are, that are there for youth-led organizations. And there's also issues of power dynamics. Um, some stakeholders do not take the youth organization seriously due to maybe they think that they're inexperienced in uh, and lack, we lack resources. And there's also assumptions around relationships that we have in the community. Um, most of our work, we do voluntary work um, and might raise some expectations of uh, from our partners in the government departments. With there are also partnership challenges um, that are there once uh, youth organization partners. These are contractual obligations. Um, there are a lot of requirements that are needed before um, youth-led organizations are funded. There's also respectful partnership communication and timelines challenges. Um, the, the, the reception and the, the communication between the donors and the youth organizations is a bit uh, slow. There's also cash flow issues and challenges that youth-led organizations like youth uh, YSD faces and assumptions and expectations around capacity. For example, um, when uh, when partners work with youth-led organizations, uh, they have some assumptions that maybe they may have very strong relationships with some of uh, the ministry, the uh, government ministries, which sometimes is not the case. Yeah, so those are the, a few challenges that um, youth-led organizations face uh, in partnerships. So what are the best practices uh, for partnering with youth-led organizations? Um, I'll give an example of MCDL from what we have experienced as youth for the sustainable development. One of them is capacity development support. From the start of the award, um, MCGL allocated funding to areas that are needed to build capacity. Uh, they also tailored mentorship and technical assistance. So uh, continuous communication and support. We've also listened to the needs of the of, of, of our organizations and so it's a good practice to listen to the needs of youth partner organizations. Um, as an organization, you might come in with a certain plan for how you are going to engage or to support the youth-led organizations, but you also need to be flexible with, with that plan and adjust to meet the needs of your, of, of your partner. For example, um, MTGL has been flexible enough to uh, support us in um, networking with other youth-led organizations that are, are practicing social accountability ability for better learning. Um, this partnership has given, um, so creating a learning journey with, with this partner. So we have, um, with MCGL who has monthly learning calls with the YSD. So the, 
this has given us a good um, walking journey and we are mentorship. So this partnership has given us more power and energy to continue working to improve the state of, of service provision in Matakos County, as well as attract more partners and individuals who are willing to work with us. This partnership is unique and it, it connects us to only not only a national capacity, but also globally. And this has increased our learnings within our organizations and challenged our members and volunteers to think bigger and utilize our creativity to solutions. Yeah, and uh, we've also improved, uh, we've become more innovative and um, optimistic about the future. Um, there are so many opportunities out there. Um, I think we need to think about uh, the future. And um, so why should you partner with YLOs? I've talked about that. What are the opportunities for future partnerships with youth-led organizations? Uh, promote the value and a unique role of youth-led social, uh, social accountability and other sexual reproductive health areas projects. So give us a ch the chance to showcase our skills and opportunities to grow. Um, give us the chance to showcase our skills and opportunities to grow. Empowering youth uh, empowers the whole community. So as you think about partnering with youth-led organization, we want to walk away with two things. One, youth-led organizations provide substantial value add to social accountability work, and we have a unique role to play within this space. But also, this value add extends beyond social accountability to other projects the organization is involved with. We told you, I've told you about um, the value we have brought to MCGL, but each youth-led organization can bring different things to the partnership and projects. By partnering with uh, youth-led organizations, you give us opportunities to showcase our skills and grow as an organization. Additionally, when you partner with, with youth-led organizations and empower us as young people, you are not only empowering youth, you are empowering the whole community. Um, for example, the issues that we are, we, we are, we are tackling uh, in family planning and sexual productive health in health facilities here in Kenya. These issues are not only faced by young people, they are also faced by the whole community. So by us um, bringing duty bearers to be accountable for those things and are actually making the services better, we are actually um, improving services for the whole community. And lastly, if you're interested in learning more about how to partner with youth, we invite you to look at the resources link will be shared uh, in the chat. Um, so we have We Trust Youth and uh, High Impact Practice, which are uh, platforms where you can learn more on how to engage youth partners. Thank you so much, and I look forward to our discussion uh, later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was really, really interesting. And I think we'll definitely want to come back and discuss some of the challenges you've described. It'll be interesting to see if they're unique to your situation and, um, and your partnerships, or if they tend to be common among all of the different partnerships we're speaking about today. But I'd like to take a chance just to ask you a quick follow-up question um, before we move on to the next presentations. Um, and that is to talk a little bit about the best practices that you spoke about. Um, you spoke about the importance of creating a learning journey for youth partners from YSD's experience, what are some of the methods um, and tools that can be used to create a learning journey? So um, I think I mentioned about the monthly learning calls that we have with Moment, uh, MCGL. We have uh, an implementation mapping tool that we uh, we keep uh, in the on a monthly learning calls. We keep shaping our project, learning and enhancing projects. We uh, discuss about the learnings, the challenges, and how to adapt challenges um, and it allows information sharing and bringing different perspectives. Uh, it also allows buy in from all and encourages certain actions to be taken from moving on to new milestones. It helps to increase efficiency and focus on the important things that um, important things that give, gives us results. Um, one example of a challenge that uh, we have overcome through our monthly learning calls is that we used to have um, awareness sessions and uh, on both online and physical and through our monthly calls um, we learned that it was important to engage a ministry of health staff who can act as a sustainability um, tool for maybe for young people who want to access such services uh, and we keep adapting to, to uh, improve our, 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 our program the other learning um, opportunity has been net mapping. 
So from the net mapping, we have been able to identify um, actors who um, who are promoting our work and actors who are hindering uh, youth social accountability. So we've been able to address and 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 plan uh, how to to work around that. Uh, and we also uh, realized that policymakers are a crucial part in social accountability, and it's a crucial. It is very crucial to involve them in all our social accountability work. And we've, we've been able to adapt that, and we are now um, involving them in our work. So yeah, so those two methods have really worked for us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Margaret. We'll discuss more. Um in a little bit. So next we have Dr. Angel Mucci. Um, Angel, over to you. Thank you very much for having me today as a key contributor to this very important discussion. <clears throat> My presentation will focus on lessons from Zambia in regards to building locally led partnerships for accountability mechanism, and more so in what <clears throat> this concept is talking about. Next. Next slide. Uh, is this a correct or no? Maybe. <clears throat> Just uh, 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 um, okay. So, uh, building equitable and um, <clears throat> empowering partnerships, deploying uh, participatory and suitable capacity development approaches, and uh, fostering inclusive accountability. The Zambian government and Ministry of Health has several mechanisms to foster accountability. And MOH has been working in partnership with uh, civil society for a long, long time as a key partner in health sector. However, in my focus in this discussion today, <clears throat> I will talk about partnership between Ministry of Health and the, the advocacy and accountability collaboration. Uh, Zambia app, which I will refer to as talk in uh, short. The Zambia has um, progressed towards uh, attaining the middle, lower middle income status. And that places the uh, Ministry of Health in a situation where achievement of lower middle income must be the next target. And in this regard, partnerships within health sector and across uh, sectors become a cornerstone to achieving that uh, uh, target. <clears throat> and the program like family planning seems to have attracted a wider partnership cause it transcends between health, uh, beyond health, and um, Zambia in the process has been making commitments, particularly in family planning. And therefore, because we've been making commitments, it becomes imperative that some form of accountability mechanism be in place. And there are several mechanisms in, in place and that also may include the family planning technical uh, working group. Uh, next. All right, the partnership with TAU Hub uh, started in 2021 under coordination by a local civil society. And this was the Center for Reproductive Health and Education um, with technical support from Japaigo and funding from USID via a new partnership initiative through the Momentum uh, Control uh, global uh, um, uh, leadership. <clears throat> the partnership process started with the landscaping exercise where civil societies engaged Ministry of Health to understand 
how we value their work as civil society, uh, where they need to do better to ensure our partnership supports government priorities and the areas where they need to make improvements. And what we can see in the slide are the several areas where we um, tend to collaborate and uh, 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 considered as we engage with civil society. Just a few of them, budget tracking and uh, social accountability was uh, one of them. Inclusion of voices of people with lived experiences was uh, another. I think uh, those others, you can read them. So Minister of Health po pointed out um, coordination and the uh, capacity strengthening as some areas of improvement. Center for Reproductive Health, uh, fortunately, has invested in a long, um, in, in knowledge sharing um, uh, a platform where learning, new learnings and government credible documents and processes are quickly shared across all provinces. So all of them are able to access them at the same time. And this, should, this is to the membership of the Tau Cow. A demonstration that uh, they took our feedback and uh, the partnership uh, was uh, taken very seriously. This move also helps uh, uh, governments to be accountable to sharing information with partners and citizens, given the, 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 the far uh, reach that uh, the Tau Kau has across the country. So what we are doing together to ensure the civil society voices are included in the formulation of policies and fostering joint accountability for results for Ministry of Health targets, of course, starting with family planning and of uh, moving on productive health services. Next slide. The Advocacy and Accountability Collaborative Hub, uh, this is a country where the civil society organization and the youth partners mobilization is a lot of work as uh, you um, are aware. Minister of Health partnership with TAU, for instance, is uh, lifting off this heavy responsibility. And uh, it also ensures our partners have the channel to ensure government information, evidence, policies, reach all constituency members um, as I earlier uh, stated and in good time. <clears throat> this is one way uh, value add to our partnership to foster accountability and uh, in the process, uh, transparency is ensured. The foundation for strong accountability is first built with the uh, policies, plans and budgets um, at the time of uh, uh, planning through the Directorate of Public Health, where I belong, civil society, were engaged in the processes of developing some of the following documents. And these include the, the family planning 2030 commitments and also the costed implementation plan, which runs from 2021 to 2026. The reproductive health policy and the adolescent health strategic plan was another document that was a um, developed with the in engagement of the civil society and the RIMNCH roadmap. With the current TAC hub coordination, Ministry of Health is also benefiting to ensure a cross sector priorities are also shared by civil societies in their mapped aligned policy spaces. And uh, that also includes the eighth national development plan, which is the latest to be added to the documents that uh, have been produced with engagement of civil society. Great work continue and learning continues. But what is my message? Next slide. My message is joint accountability is critical. Um, 
it is also important to balance close collaboration with the, uh, with government and respect is also important in this process. Civil society and youth organization and accountability work is needed. And lastly, critical for civil society to end government trust. But of course, all this is supposed to uh, lead into improving the quality of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. And I just wanted to make a note to the audience that we will make all these slides available. Um, they'll be available on the Maternal Health Initiative event web page where you're watching the event right now. So I think it would be interesting for people to be able to go back and particularly read um, all the details in the slides about the feedback from the Ministries of Health towards the civil society organizations. Um, and Angel, I just wanted to ask one follow-up question. Um, could you share a main message or learning that you would share with other governments in low and middle income countries who are also working to strengthen their partnerships um, with country CSOs to enhance accountability for sustainable healthcare? What would be a, me a main message or, or learning that you could share with other governments in a similar situation? Uh, I, I, I hope I'm un unmuted. You're able to get Yep, me? I can hear you, yes. Yeah, so one observation that I've seen between most uh, governments and civil societies that uh, they tend to work in uh, um, antagonism. And uh, what we learn from the process of close collaboration with civil society is that uh, you can actually leverage on, on them to move your agenda as part of government, because there are certain things that uh, particularly civil servants can do and cannot do. There are certain things that civil servants can say and cannot say. So a close collaboration with the civil society provides you an opportunity with a voice that you can use in a situation where you are able to. I think that would be my message to other countries and uh, governments working with civil society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we will move on to Leeton Xavier, um, who's at LAM Hospital, Bangladesh. Xavier, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shara, and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to you all, and welcome to my presentation. Uh, this is Leighton Bala working as a program director with World Mission Prayer League, LAMP Hospital. It is in the northern part of Bangladesh. Today, I'm going to present deploying capacity development, a process that prioritizes sustainability and local leadership. Next slide, please. Before I going to present details, just I want to share with very brief of LAMP Hospital. LAM stands for Lutheran Native Medicine Bangladesh. It started its operation in 1976. Currently, we are reaching 6.3 million people in the northern part. And our main goal, the people of Bangladesh, transformed by the love of God, experience abundant life in healthy and just communities. Next slide, please. So to achieve this goal, we have seven core programs. And we also have seven departments. So all these programs are being implemented through our seven department so that we can achieve our ultimate objectives and goal. Next slide, please. Since LAM started its operation in this area, we have to keep focus to strengthen the capacity of community people for improved family planning and MNCA services, as well as we, we are focused to increase our organizational capacity as well. So to implement our activities, we are focusing a key approach. It is continuum of care from household to community to hospital. At household level, we are focusing to mobilize the community people so that they can uh, they can use the services from the health facilities. We also help to ready the community-based health facilities 
to ensure the 24 by 7 services for this community. At hospital level, we ready our own hospital. It is tertiary level hospital. As well as we influence the government secondary and tertiary level hospital so that we can ensure the effective referral care for the people from this area. So this way we ensure the continuum of care. So now, now the question is why the important to develop the capacity of the community people and the organization. So as the organization, we want to see that the community people are empowered. They take the ownership for their own community development. As well as we focus them to resolve their own community problems by themselves and make them capable so that they can advocate with different entities or government or the like-minded organization to tapping some resources for their own community development. You also enable them to make decision by themselves for their own community and own future development by themselves. So to achieve this objective, we engage the community people, especially the community volunteers, school teachers, and adolescents, so that we can uh, educate them on the health issues. And these people are in their community to disseminate this message to their neighbors, to their uh, peers, so that these people encourage to use the uh, services of the community vessel facilities. We also develop the capacity of community health workers community health service provider, including the government health service provider as well. Uh, in our country, these community uh, health care service providers are residing in their own community. So it is easy access for the community people to have the services from these people. In our country context, we have some community-based health committee, uh, especially under the government health service center, under some uh, private health facilities under some civil society. We focus to develop their capacity. As well as there are some community group like uh, decision maker group, household decision maker group, change maker group. We have some aunties group and adolescent group. We also build their leadership capacity. We also build their management capacity, programming capacity so that they can uh, develop their own action plan for their community to bring some changes so that they can uh, monitor the development initiative by different organization as well as we focus them to advocate with different uh, stakeholder to get some resources. We also uh, focus to empower the community women to engage them in the income generating activities. In our country context, uh, women are really uh, deprived economically, but we focus them so that they can use their own resources for their uh, health facilities, for their own development. Side by side, we also focus to develop the capacity of men group and boys group to change their attitude, to support their wives and girls for having improved MNCs and SRI services. Uh, from different uh, health facilities. So this way, we are working with different community groups to bring the changes. And as a result, we have some good uh, changes in the community. We have some good lesson learned. Next slide, please. In our community, we have 21 community-based health facilities. And this facilities is now run by this community group by their own financing. They ensure the materials and resources. We also observe that the uptake of services or utilization of services gradually increased because the community health workers and community health care providers are residing in their own community. And we believe that this service will continue whether LAMB will uh, working in these facilities or not. Next slide, please. Beside that, uh, already I shared with you, we also focusing our own capacity development. And we are very happy that last year, Momentum team, team work with us. 
and we have gone through a rigorous process. It is a ITOCA capacity assessment. It's a integrated technical and organizational capacity assessment. And the momentum team support us to assess ourselves and uh, identifying some areas to develop further, especially in the sustainability assessment area, our research development, uh, mobilization strategy area, our strategic planning area, our quality assurance plan, and programming for uh, gender-based violence, gender transformative issue, and youth development programming. And last couple of months, they trained us on several issues and uh, sit with us uh, for uh, review the progress, providing the feedback on our document. So this way, this team help us to develop our own capacity so that we can ensure our total, total quality management in our organization. Next slide, please. So after the ITOC assessment, we think differently. Most of the organization focus on the sustainability, uh, financial sustainability, but from last year, we focus on impact sustainability as well. And we choose seven criteria to assess our organizational impact sustainability. And we have some uh, good findings to move forward and the department is ready to develop their own sustainability plan to move forward. As well as we also focusing our financial sustainability, especially the local fund diversif diversification. We work with a lot of local organization for uh, resource diversification, optimize, optimize the resources, as well as we also uh, working with government to get some support from them to sustain our organization to provide the services. We're also focusing our uh, health workforce development. We have diploma nursing and midwifery training center in our organization to produce health workforce. We also uh, build the capacity of our own existing health service provider to provide the quality services. We also have our succession plan. We have our talent pool so that we develop them to take the future leadership for our organization. We also focus to build the capacity of our community people, especially adolescent, youth group, and community leaders group, so that they can monitor the development activities of their own community. Side by side, we also focus on some practical issue. We are very open to adopt the best models or practice or lesson learned either it is from the international or national or community. So we ensure the cross pollination of ideas to bring the greater impact in our organization and community. You know that in our organization, we have some international volunteer, but currently we are facing some uh, difficulties to get their work permit. But it also guide us differently, think differently, develop our national capacity so that we can take our leadership role to run our organization very smoothly. And we also invest for developing the talent for the nation, for this country, rather focusing our organization because anyone can move, anyone can live from our organization. But we want to see that the capacitated people are working for this nation. So this way we are working towards local sustainability, local leadership sustainability by focusing the engaging of community people and increasing our own capacity. So thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Xavier. Um, you know, you really touched quite a bit on different capacity um, development approaches. And one thing just quickly, because then we, we need to move on um, to Ibuyani, but just quickly, you mentioned um, a tool that Liam used um, called I the ITOCA assessment. Can you just quickly let us know through the use of that tool where LAM is now in terms of building its organizational capacity for the future? It's a big question and you only have a few seconds to answer it, but just to give you a, a moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, according to the ITOCA tools, there are some cap uh, organizational capacity building area and programmatic area. So as an organization, we choose six areas, especially our uh, uh, financial area, our ACR area, our uh, partnership area, our uh, uh, 
SCM it means uh, it's a supply chain management area and in programming gender transformative transformative area youth programming area so as an organization we uh, put our self scoring and uh, mcgl team guide us to develop our action plan in which area we need to develop further so this way we are working together to develop ourselves and we are very happy to let you know that we are in a good progress and hope Hopefully we complete our all those document within July and it will be uh, approved by September. So DJ, you are working with the MCGL team and thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'm glad to hear that positive progress report. Thank you so much. Okay, now we will move on to Ibu Yani, um, who's at the Ministry of Health in Indonesia. The floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for distinguished speakers and distinguished participants. First of all, uh, thank you, you said Momentum and Wilson Center for giving me this opportunity uh, to take a part in this meeting. My presentation is focusing on facilitating public-private partnership to improve quality of care in Indonesia and explaining uh, the lesson learned in Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Indonesia, uh, like other low middle income country, uh, still have some persistent health problems uh, such as high IMR and MMR, uh, and also nutrition, the number of TB, and based on this problem, uh, Ministry of Health has established the transformation of health system. And uh, there are six pillars of the transformation, uh, which are the primary health service transformation, the referral service transformation, health resilience system transformation, health financing system transformation, human resource of health transformation and health technology transformation. So the fundamental transformation is on primary health service transformation and referral service tra transformation, uh, both in public and private and also the public-private partnership. And the other things about health resilience system transformation, it is also important because uh, after having COVID-19 pandemic, so we reviewing our health system and in the future, we should uh, more uh, ready to uh, another pandemic. So I think how to strengthen our production, the local production of medicine and also the medical equipment. And for enabling factors, we also should uh, strengthen the health financing, the human resource of health and the health technology. And our objective is how to improve the maternal, neonatal, family planning, and reproductive health, and how to accelerate the improvement of community nutrition, how to improve the disease control, and how to uh, also how to sustain our uh, uh, healthy life. Uh, of the community and also to strengthening the health system. Next slide, please. Uh, the quality improvement strategy for 2020 until 2024 is to increase the distribution of quality basic health services and referral for the community by equitable distribution, distribution of quality basic health facilities and referrals 
through the quality improvement intervention, namely the implementation of equitable accreditation of health facilities. An improvement of the accreditation system by providing accreditation standards and instrument, information system, survey administration, and also strengthening the quality management system, such as registration, licensing, certification, and implementation of the quality measurement of health services at health facilities. So uh, the, the effort to improve the quality of hospital are carried out by ensuring that they are registered and licensed, uh, implementing the 30, 13 national hospital quality indicators, which is internal intervention and uh, also compliance with the patient safety incident reports and the external interventions by providing accreditation assessment. Next slide. And MPHD will seek the implementation of public private partnerships by linking support for improving the quality of MNH services, starting from intervention at the health facilities, uh, both private and public facilities, which will become data or information and also gaps in the quality MNH services. This information will then be discussed and advocated by the working group uh, for MNH at the district or city level so that uh, the follow-up action plan is arranged, then we'll encourage the, re the realization of public part uh, private partnership both in terms of equal distribution of resources, policies, in terms of increasing the capacity of health workers, increase access to financing involving the private sectors and also cross-sectors engagement. Next slide. Uh, the total market involvement is needed in an effort to optimize the involvement of the private sectors, both the private sectors in the health sectors and in the non-health sectors. This is especially necessary in the fulfillment of health resources and financing health services. Next slide, please. The major challenges identified, such as the lack of assurance in the project agreement, which need mechanism and regulation for quality of care from government, and also lack of institutional capacity and readiness, which at the local level need more significant and also the local government roles. Lack of interest and financial impact from the private sector side, such as focusing in more profitable services than maternal and newborn care. And the short-term vision is in terms of investment resulted of no or lack monitoring and evaluation to the partnership particularly on implementation of the regulation and standard of care by private sectors. Next slide. And according to evidence given by National Development Planning Agency, that health only contributes 40% of maternal and neonatal mortality while non-health contribute the rest or 60%. Therefore, 
coordination interministerial uh, they are ministry of home affair industry information manpower transportation and so on are important to bring the non-health factors including the private sectors in effort to reduce maternal and neonatal mortality particularly through public private partnership and uh, the second uh, public private partnership regulation to be disseminated in order to have shared vision among public and private stakeholders and the last one once established the partnership need to be monitored together with the new ministry of health policy on digital transformation monitoring and evaluation can be conducted using the latest available information technology and the data can be stored at health big data thank you very much thank you so much Ibuyani. um and again we will be sharing these slides out on the event website we have just about 30 minutes left of the event but i wanted Ibuyani to give you a question quick before um, i ask some questions to the whole panel and i know we have questions coming in through the chat box you still have time if you have a question please put it in the chat box or send it to us on an email um, at mhi at wilsoncenter.org ibu yani um you described a very interesting and also very complex system for building these public private partnerships um really to improve the um, quality of maternal and newborn health services sustaining and in institutionalizing mechanisms for quality of care has long been um, an issue and a difficulty for many, what do you think would be the most critical element to foster sustainability of these public-private partnerships? And I'm gonna ask you to keep your question to just a minute, um, a quick response for a big question so we can move on to the audience questions as well. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, I think uh, the role of government is important. Uh, how uh, the government uh, must be uh, continue to uh, to make the network with the private sectors, and also the other thing is collaboration between public and uh, private uh, should be strengthened. And the last one is uh, uh, about the clear regulation and maybe if needed uh, the government should involve the private sectors uh, when designing or concepting and arranging the regulation for the public private partnership in health sectors thank that's you. great thank you thank you and that's really really helpful um some of the key terms that you, you've just mentioned, but others have as well. You know, you've got the trust, clarity, collaboration, um, flexibility, Jackie mentioned. I mean, I think these go across all of these different types of partnerships we're speaking about today. So I wanted to ask a question to the whole panel. Um, and if you want to answer, please just unmute and jump into the conversation. Um, this event is, you know, talking about the power of partnerships. It's also talking about this time that we're in um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, you know, I'm wondering, as we are living in this transformed world due to the pandemic, did COVID-19 and the response to it and the continuing response influence how you think about these partnerships or how you've structured your partnerships, um, each one of you in your own individual situation? Has it had a large impact on how you've gone about making these partnerships and keeping these partnerships. Who would like to go first? Margaret, I'm going to turn it to you because you went first in the opening comments. But how have you found COVID-19? How has it really affected um, the youth led organizations abilities to you know, have these you know, partnerships with others? Have you seen there be real um, barriers and have there been some successful ways to override those barriers? 
Um, COVID-19 with a lot of barriers, but I'm not going to focus on the barriers, but I'm going to talk about opportunities that it opened up for youth-led organizations like ours, because um, we were lucky enough to get funding during COVID-19 period. I think it opened up opportunities for grassroots organizations to work with um, the donors. Um, so I think it opened up opportunities because uh, they've seen uh, the ability of uh, grassroots organizations because they're in touch with communities that um, they work with um, they don't have to come all the way from you know outside the can uh, out uh, other countries to come and bring change but actually we have young people in those communities who can actually um, spearhead that change so um, it opened up opportunities for grassroots organizations and youth-led organizations like ours so yeah Wonderful, thank you. Who else? Xavier, how about you? Okay, thank you. Yeah, initially it is it was affected uh, a little bit, but as an organization in this northern part, we have a good reputation at all level of people. It is uh, top to bottom. It's community level to government high officials. They know very well about LAM and we have a easy access in the community, whether they declare the lockdown, they restricted the movement, but as a LAM employee, LAM staff, we have easy access in the community. So this is a good advantage for us to reach the community people. And community people also uh, trust us whatever lamp delivered, it is absolutely scientific. It is absolutely uh, true service. That's why we encash this opportunity to reach the community people to disseminate the uh, COVID related message, as well as we also ensure the uh, sanit sanitization issues, hand washing facilities, masks, and all those things for these communities for any health related issue. And we open up our own hospital as well as we ensure the community level government hospital along with our own development safe delivery unit so that people can easily access the service from these facilities. And we uh, keep on uh, communication on the community because most of the health workers are in their own community. And we have a virtual communication through WhatsApp, through uh, other uh, types of um, apps by which we easily reach to the community people. And our community health workers uh, reach to the every household to disseminate the message. So this way, we are working with this community to ensure the MNCS related services along with the other general services so that uh, they can uh, have their own quality, quality health facilities. So this way you are working. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Angel, how about you? Did you, have you had to change at all um, how you've handled creating these partnerships um, during the pandemic? Yes, I, <clears throat> I think our um, engagement with the uh, 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 civil society and many uh, 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 stakeholders in the uh, uh, reproductive health have been affected in both ways, both positive, positively and negatively. I will start with the positive sense. I initially, uh, uh, just from the Minister of Health, we found ourselves in a situation where we were not able to have physical meetings and then things were just stuck for, for a long time. But then through these discussions with our colleagues in civil society, we started uh, proposing to say, no, we can still proceed with some of these activities virtually. And uh, yeah, we tried and we started first with taken co-working group meetings. We are able to meet now more regularly than we were physically. And uh, let me just mention that what I shared in my presentation, the documents that we developed, the 2030 commitments for family planning, the costed implementation plan for family planning, the um, reproductive health policy, all those were done through virtual processes. We could do work on the document, share it, meet virtually, have feedback until the document is completed and signed. So I think in a, in a way, COVID affected the, our collaboration, but uh, somehow in a positive sense, uh, when you look at it from that angle. 
in the negative sense that uh, we also uh, wish if our colleagues that uh, advocate for particularly certain services, even finances, if they could uh, physically get to parliament, talk to parliamentarians, chant, march and say, we need these things funded. We need money for these services. In that sense, we've been affected negatively because because of the COVID regulations, they may not be allowed uh, allowed in the parliament uh, premises and uh, getting close to parliament. So I think it has affected us both ways, both in the positive sense and negative sense. And just to conclude, the uh, last month, parliamentarians of uh, in, in Sweden had to engage our minister on comprehensive sexuality education. This was not possible before, but now our minister was able to meet with parliamentarians in Sweden while it's them there in Sweden and our minister is in Zambia. So I think it has impacted us in several ways, both positive and negative. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. That's really helpful. Um, Ibu Yanni, do you have something to add? Um, yeah, according to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, we are facing uh, the pandemic is affecting uh, for non-COVID issue. Yeah, uh, because actually uh, before pandemic uh, in Indonesia, uh, we just uh, starting how to set the regulation on public-private partnership, especially for fin health financing side. And, uh, and then the pandemic is coming. So uh, some program that will be conducted under PTP uh, financing. So we, uh, we have to hold for a moment and also uh, after the pandemic is going slow down and now uh, we uh, begin to start the, the program and now we have MPHD and that one of the intermediate result is how to strengthen the uh, public-private partnership. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to shift um, gears and go to the audience um, Q&A. We have a couple of questions. Um, the first of which is, um, and this, anyone, again, just jump in and answer this question. I'll be, I'm interested to um, hear the answers you have. How are religious leaders and faith-based organizations involved in these engagements and partnerships? Um, I know that they were mentioned in some of the presentations, but it, would any of you be able to speak a little bit more on how you're engaging um, faith-based organizations and religious leaders? Okay, I need to share from my perspective. So especially it's in, uh, Bangladesh is a Muslim country and we have a good relationship with the, uh, it's a mosque leader, it's a imam, those who are religious leader. So especially we focus uh, focus them and build their capacity, and we engage uh, them to award their people about especially about the COVID nineteen uh, because uh, they have a good uh, uh, influence to the people. Uh, the people easily believe them. That's why we target this group to engage uh, to educate the people when the when uh, especially in the Friday prayer. It's a Juma prayer. After the Juma prayer. Uh, they disseminate the message and they share how uh, the community health facilities and LAMB hospital provide the services during that time and the hospital is open 24 by 7. So these people really help us a lot to educate the people, to ensure the services and uh, encourage the people. So, okay, it's a problem, but we have to deal with that. And there is a lot of way, there is a uh, our own hospital, our own community, we take the initiative to face it and move forward. So this way, this group help us a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have experience working with faith-based organizations?
No? Okay, then I'll move on because we have more questions. Uh, Margaret, I think this one is geared towards you, but others can also respond. Um, the question is, youth associations run into challenges when raising funds to run their programs because their project proposals might not be to the level um, and the quality that some Western donors particularly require. Is there a way that you've encountered um, or that you would suggest by which donor agencies can alter their demands to allow and encourage youth-led organizations to access funding? Um, yeah, I think I mentioned that as one of the barriers. Um, the the expectations and the contractual obligations that are there. Um, I think what has worked well, uh, and I'll give it as an example with MCGL, is that the application was not based on writing a whole proposal um, uh, using a template from, uh, you know, maybe USAID or all these other organizations, but it was a, it was like a Google form. So it was a guided questions. You answered them. Have you done this? Have you done that? Um, and later when they are doing now their due diligence is when now they'll uh, go deeper to ask for um, deep maybe policies and all that. So if they, the partners can make the application process easy for youth-led organizations or for uh, uh, growing organizations, it's better than to put, um, put out proposals that are very complicated for these uh, organizations. Yeah. Oh, that's a great, that's a great example. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything they want to contribute to that? Have you seen different forms of um, funding, people looking for funding with various ways to really encourage youth-led organizations? No, that's okay. Um, we'll move on. And, and Angel, this um, question is directed to you, but again, if other people have comments, please feel free. Um, what are some of the challenges of engaging and supporting TAC Hub Initiative and how has the government addressed those? Then you'll have to tell us what the TAC Hub initiative is. It's T-A-A-C, they put in the question. <laughs> is that a tough one? <laughs> no, no, not, not, not exactly a tough one. So this is the... Um, um, um the accountability and the collaboration um uh, uh, they, they, obviously you may have uh, um the benefits that we centered on most but of course as you rightly uh, put it there, there are also uh, uh, challenges um working with the civil society and um, the challenges emanate from the fact that uh, there are many civil society organizations. I don't know how many there are in, uh, uh, in, in Kenya, but I know my colleague will agree that there are thousands and thousands. Some of them you may have not even understood um, uh, where they are emanating from. So some civil uh, and because there are many, they, it's possible that they can get influenced based on um, the funding. So they may be influenced to push a particular agenda that um, might work against you as a program person. So um, what you may require to do is to work with the, the um, uh, registration uh, because there are so many of them, government uh, in most uh, African countries have decided that they have to have them on the register. So you will find that uh, some of these organizations, particularly those that may be used uh, to push a certain agenda that might affect particularly uh, uh, health programs, may not even be on the register of organizations. So you may want to first uh, take, some, uh, take some history. Where is this organization coming from? Where is it uh, lo located? Are they on the register? And then 
you can um, engage them appropriately based on what you find. So indeed, there are those situations where you have the negative effects of uh, um, working with civil society. Thank you. Great, thank you. And, and yes, it was the advocacy and accountability collaborative um, acronyms are not, not my strength. So perfect. Um, thank you so much for that. Our final question um, before I'll have you each just do a really quick, you know, final 30 second um, comment. Our final question that some of you have touched on a bit um, is sustainable programming needs continued availability of funds. How can we shift away from traditional donor government dependency and towards establishing income generating activities by you know, government health facilities, youth led organizations or community um, led organizations? Does anyone have ideas for that? Margaret, go ahead. Can you sure, sure. Um, how can we shift away from traditional donor government dependency towards establishing income generating activities, you know, with your, within your partnership? So for you, how youth led organizations could do their own income generation. Um, and, you know, Xavier, you know, you're talking about like how the community could do the same. And then for others, you know, how the government health facilities could also do some of their own income generation. Anyone have a thought on that, that question? Go ahead, Margaret. Um, I'll just give an answer that I think uh, would work. Um, I think we need to move from the dependency to actually um, tapping into um, our abilities and the skills of the organization. Um, for example, in need for sustainable development, most of the volunteers and staff members have been capacity built and trained to be trainers for maybe skills, education for young people. So how can this uh, be uh, changed into maybe um, them uh, making it an income generating um, um, activity for the organizations so that they can be able to, you know, maybe be consultants in such fields and all that. So just tapping into the abilities of the of the organization and the people in it and then the human resources in it can make um, income for the organization. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Iguyani. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually uh, in Indonesia, uh, our uh, national health account uh, showing us that uh, the proportion uh, donor financing is around 1%. Uh, but uh, for example, uh, in program ATM, HIV, AIDS, uh, TB, and malaria, uh, the financing of this program is 60% coming from donors. So yeah, maybe in several years ago, the government uh, uh, start to uh, how to gradually uh, reduce the donor funding and uh, shifting to the government funding to the national budget. So I think it is important uh, how to think, uh, how to shifting the funding uh, by, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, to, to reduce the depending the dependency from the donors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Xavier, go ahead. Okay. Uh, for our community uh, initiative, because we already, I already shared that we have uh, 21 health facilities, community health facilities that's run by the community uh, people. So in every six months, they gather, uh, they arrange a donor gathering. It's a local donor gathering. So in this gathering, people voluntarily uh, donate some uh, uh, resources, some money, some uh, crops or paddy or rice, whatever they want to donate. Uh, they also uh, communicate with some uh, 
industrial is it's a uh, there are a lot of rice husking industry in this area so this group communicate with them to get some fund from them uh, they also uh, communicate with some uh, big conglomerate uh, medicine company or pharmaceutical company so uh, they are uh, giving some uh, donation as a corporate social responsibility uh, in in this area there is a coal mine uh, there is a coal mine uh, so from the coal mine they also collect some fund for their own community so this way they are collecting uh, fund from the different sources and for lamb as an organization uh, we also uh, focusing to uh, working with the like minded organization so that we can avoid the overlapping overlapping of our activities uh, we can share our resources to reach the more people we also uh, focus to produce the providing the quality services so that people can uh, uh, pay their fee for services this way we are focusing to raise our local income so that we can sustain our organization thank you thank you very much angel did you want to make a last comment before we kick things over to closing yes. remarks uh, thank you and i think this question you are asking the, it's a very important question and uh, we believe that uh, our colleagues uh, uh, working with civil society can uh, help uh, put this on the table, particularly with the government, because um, the health services in a country must be supported by um, uh, the government of that particular country. And uh, therefore, having um, a huge donor dependence makes it very difficult, particularly for sustainability of uh, programs. Therefore, what you need first is a voice. We need a voice who can speak. Me as a civil servant, it's very difficult for me to raise this voice and say, we have this, we have a gap in there, we have a gap in there, but it's quite easy for the civil society to come, get the records from the ministries, see where the funding is available, where the funding is not available and engage governments that we have these resources not available for this program, not available for this program, how can we move forward? Not only look at the gaps that are not funded, but also look at it, programs that are hugely funded by cooperating partners, the donors, to say all these programs are being funded by cooperating partners. How is the government moving in terms of taking over this burden of having these uh, programs uh, supported? But we also have certain, seen certain movements uh, from our colleagues from the UN. They are talking about what they are saying, the compact, where they now expect governments to pay a certain percentage before they produce their money. I think that uh, the civil society should be in the forefront to highlight such ideas like the compact, make it widely known so that people know that uh, these donors are now saying that uh, for us to give our money, we need a certain commitment from your government. So we need a voice from the civil society. And I think in that way, the programs will eventually get funded by the governments of, uh, uh, of each country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a great way to almost close, but not quite yet. <laughs> now we're going to kick things off to Dr. Koki Argwa, who is going to give us some closing remarks. remarks. <clears throat> Koki is the project director of USAID's Momentum Country and Global Leadership Program and vice president of DC operations for Japaigo. Dr. Agarwal is an internationally recognized expert in safe motherhood, reproductive health and family planning policies and programs, and has more than 25 years of service delivery experience in reproductive health, family planning, and maternal health. Um, she is also an absolute pleasure to work with, and this is my fifth year partnering with Koki. So please, Koki, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to all the presenters and panelists who have shared their expertise and perspectives with us today. I think it's been fabulous to hear from them. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Wilson uh, Center's uh, Maternal Health Initiative for this tremendous partnership that we have experienced. As Sarah mentioned, today is the final uh, event in a three-part series on elevating country voices in the global dialogue on maternal newborn 
child and adolescent health and family planning. And I cannot think of a more appropriate and fitting, interesting finale than this wonderful discussion that we've had today. Throughout the series, we've been discussing the ways in which COVID-19 pandemic has challenged the health system and particularly the delivery of equitable and quality care for maternal newborn child health and adolescent health. But if there's one overall lesson that COVID-19 has taught us, it is that there's no one size fits all to approach in the approach to improving health. And some of these big challenges of our time require a different way of working. And that different way of working needs to be built on new kinds of partnerships, ones that are flexible, more responsive, and, all, and most of all, locally led. So thanks to all the part, uh, panelists who shared the insights and experience and expertise on building these types of partnerships, as well as the capacity development approaches and inclusive processes that can support them. So today, Margaret showed the unique role that and the value that youth organizations bring to the table and outlined concrete best practices on listening to youth and creating tailored and ongoing mentorship that responds to their needs. And from Zambia, Dr. Muiche uh, detailed how partnership between government and civil society can be built to foster accountability and to ensure government priorities reflect the community priorities. Liton from Bangladesh shared the empowering organizational-led building approaches that LAM has used, not just to strengthen one community or one organization, but work in, entirely in all of Bangladesh. And Ibuyani detailed how Indonesia is working to build public-private partnerships to improve the delivery of high quality and improve access to maternal newborn health services. So it's clear from all of this that a more expansive approach to partnership requires a few things. Firstly, it requires an openness, an openness to a new way of working, to new principles, mechanisms, and partners that may not be part of business as usual. And that, of course, requires time, because business as usual can be fast, but as many of the panelists pointed out, that it takes time to create and foster new partnerships and to deploy the capacity building approaches that lower the barriers to enter such partnerships. And lastly, it requires a true shift in leadership and priority setting to countries and communities. And some of our uh, panelists today exhibited this leadership that they have been demonstrating. So building strong and inclusive partnerships for maternal newborn child health family planning programs is not future work. It's urgent and it's right now work. Many countries are at risk of missing goals and we are now playing catch up because of COVID-19 and not just accelerating our progress. And we cannot do it without with the usual method. We need to build new partnerships. And if we don't, we will be in jeopardy without these sustainable partnerships. So thank you again to all the presenters for sharing these actionable insights that you have shared with us today. And thank you to all who joined and shared their questions and for being part of this event series. We hope that you will continue to share what's working in your country to improve the reach, quality, and sustainability of programs and that we will be able to continue to share this work with all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Koki. Um, and thank you again to all the panelists from me at the Wilson Center. And also thank you to Momentum Country Global Leadership for your partnership um, in this entire series. Um, and just some final housekeeping, the recording of this event will be available on the event page um, either later today, but definitely um, within 24 hours. We will also be producing an event summary, which we will publish on our blog. So you'll be able to read more about this event um, in the weeks to come. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, and again, thank you to our panelists. I wish you all a great um, rest of your day. <laughs>